All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Pat Kane, Public Programs Visitor Services Coordinator at the Museum of the Grand Prairie, part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District. And I want to thank you all so much for joining us today uh, to help commemorate our 16th president's birthday this weekend. Um, I want to especially thank today's presenter, uh, Barb Garvey, for providing our program titled Happy Birthday, A.B. Baby, Lincoln's Aging Face. Uh, Barb will join us in just a few short moments. Uh, before we bring Barb on and get into today's program, um, I did want to go over a few housekeeping items, um, let you know what's coming up at the Museum of the Grand Prairie, Champaign County for the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, and so much more. So first, if you haven't done so already, uh, let us know where you're watching from by writing down in the comment section where you're tuning in from today. Uh, Perry, good friend Perry, is tuning in from Urbana. Good to see you, Perry. Um, and we would love to know where everyone else is watching from this afternoon. So jot that down in the comment section below if you wouldn't mind. Um, a little bit about us. If you don't know anything about the Museum of the Grand Prairie, um, we opened originally in 1968 as the Early American Museum. And our current mission is to collect, preserve, and interpret the cultural and natural history of Champaign County and East Central Illinois for all generations. Uh, the museum is part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, a uh, collection of seven forest preserves here in Champaign County in East Central Illinois, as well as two educational facilities, which include our museum, as well as the Homer Lake Interpretive Center, our Homer Lake Forest Preserve, uh, golf course, Lake of the Woods Golf Course, uh, Kickapoo Rail Trail, and so much more. So if you're local, get out and check out some of these beautiful forest preserves. One of my favorite times uh, to get out to the forest preserves is the winter time, especially when they've been blanketed with some snow, which is what we're getting in central Illinois today. Uh, some more snow on top of snow we had here recently. Um, uh, also, we would love to hear from you um, about tonight, about today's program, as well as help us improve future programs um, uh, by completing a short program survey. Um, I just dropped into the comment section a link to the survey after today's program. Please let us know what you thought by completing the survey. That shouldn't take any more than five-ish minutes. And then also, if you have any suggestions for future programs you'd like us to do, uh, please feel free to leave those comments in the survey as well. A few programs coming up in the very near future. On Thursday, February 17th, we'll have the second program in our annual Garden Speaker Series. Uh, this year's series um, uh, will deal with medicinal plants, how humans have used them throughout history, and how to start a medicinal plant garden of your very own. Um, we'll be joined by Bethany Elkington, James Graham, and Bernard Santisario of the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences in the College of Pharmacy at the University of Illinois Chicago, where they will present the program titled Medicine and Materia Medica in the Illinois Country. Um, so check out that program. Again, it's going to be on Thursday, February 17th, streaming live on our Facebook and YouTube pages at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time. Um, for those local Lincoln fans of all ages, uh, we, welcome to, we welcome you to join us on President's Day, February 21st, a day when many school children in the area have the day off from school. Um, on that day, we'll have some engaging programs celebrating Abe's birthday at our museum. Uh, registration and a small program fee is required, and also program sizes will be kept small for COVID-19 safety reasons. Um, and you can learn more about our 16th president, his life and times um, at these great programs. We're going to offer two sessions uh, during the afternoon of February 21st. And if you'd like to learn more about those program offerings, as well as register, for those programs, uh, visit our website or Facebook page to learn more about how to do that. Again, we're gonna have some Lincoln programs on uh, President's Day, February 21st in the afternoon. Registration is required. Visit our website to learn how to register. Uh, lastly, um, it's snowing out right now um, and we currently have the CCFPD Snowflake Search um, is on. Uh, it began on January 20th where we have hidden over 40 snowflakes and. Uh, Champaign County Forest Preserves um, uh, with winter themed fun facts throughout the county. So get out and explore um, uh, Champaign County Forest Preserves to see if you can find any one of these 40 snowflakes. I already have quite a few people who have found a ton of these snowflakes out there and they're sharing their, their finds of these snowflakes on Facebook and Instagram using the hashtag CCFPD Snowflakes Search. So if you're looking for something to do this winter, uh, get out there safely, of course, um, and check out uh, some of the beautiful uh, forest preserves here in Champaign County in the wintertime. 
what better excuse to use than with the CCFPD snowflake search? See if you can find some of these 40 creatively painted and unique snowflakes out there. For more info about all of our programs and everything else happening at the Museum of the Grand Prairie and Champaign County Forest Preserve District, we encourage you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, as well as visit us at our, at our websites, museumofthegrandprairie.org and ccfpd.org. Again, let us know where you're watching from. Write that down in the comments section below. Should you have any questions for today's program, also feel free to drop those in the comments section down below. We will address questions towards the end of the program. All right, so without further ado, I'm uh, uh, pleased to bring on our guest today. Uh, not so much a guest, very familiar face, uh, Barb Garvey. Barb, how you doing? I'm doing great, Pat. How about you? Doing doing fine. Can you hear me? Can you see me okay? I can see, hear you and see you, yes. Okay, great. We can hear you and see you loud and clear. Um, okay, uh, so I'm going to introduce Barb, and then I'll turn the show over to you. So again, I want to thank Barb uh, for presenting today's program. Uh, Barbara Olschlager garvey is the director of the Museum and Education Department at the Champaign County Forest Preserve District. Uh, this includes overseeing operations of the district's educational facilities and their staff, uh, which includes the Museum of the Grand Prairie at Lake of the Woods Forest Preserve in Muhammad, uh, which focuses on local cultural and natural history, as well as the Homer Lake Interpretive Center at Homer Lake Forest Preserve in Homer, which focuses on the natural world in Champaign County and environmental education. Prior to becoming director of the department, Barb served as curator at the museum for 12 years. Um, she received her bachelor's in anthropology and art history from Indiana University in Bloomington and has a PhD in art history from the University of Illinois. Uh, Barb is originally from Cincinnati, Ohio and is cheering on the Cincinnati Bengals today um, uh, and is a big fan of baseball and the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, her other passions include all things local Abe Lincoln history related and spending time with her beautiful family. So without further ado, uh, let's turn the show over to Barb. Thank you so much, Barb. Thank you, Pat. I uh, have, to, have to shout out to Edwin Bruce Wiggins. I know him as Bruce. He said he's watching and I went to fourth grade with Bruce in Cincinnati. So nice. Hey, Bruce. Wonders of the internet. Um, <laughs> So thank you all for coming to the uh, AB, happy birthday, AB baby. <laughs> um, I chose that because it's a line from hair. So you know how old I am from the musical hair. Um, <laughs> um, today I'll be talking about portraits, photographic portraits of Abe Lincoln. And I'm going to start my PowerPoint in a second, but I wanted to just give you uh the notion that um, while I, I said we were going to talk about how Lincoln's face aged, we're just actually going to talk about um, portraits of photographic portraits of Lincoln in general. So with that, now I'm going to try to share my screen, which is always kind of a, a challenge. So wish me luck, everybody. <laughs> There it is. Okay. All right. So, um, the changing face of Abraham Lincoln, or the aging face, as I think I said in my description. Um, and we're going to look at portraits from 1843 to 1865. 1865, of course, being the year that Lincoln died. 1843 is the year of the first known photographic portrait of Lincoln, which we see on the left here. Um, and uh, you can see just how much the man aged in 22 years. Um, quite, quite, quite a bit. Probably more than we look different in 22 years. Um, what, the first time I saw this photograph on the left, I thought that's not Abe Lincoln. But if you look at, closely at how he sits, how he how and and the size of his hands and the way he holds his hands, I'm pretty convinced that it is actually Abraham Lincoln. And of course, the scholars are. Um, the uh, why 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 even look at Lincoln? Well, we see Lincoln everywhere, and we see Lincoln everywhere because 
he's on the penny. He's on, on the $5 bill and he is on amazing numbers. If you start to, especially in Illinois, he's on our license plates. He's everywhere. Um, Part of the ubiquity of Lincoln's image comes from the fact that there were 130 photographs taken of Lincoln during his lifetime. However, the president who immediately uh, came before him, James Buchanan, there are three photographs of him. So in that span of of uh, Lincoln's healthy adult life was when photography became a big deal. <laughs> um, and so we're going to move on to the first known photo, which was taken by Nicholas Shepard. Shepard advertised in the newspaper that was called the Sangamo Journal that he was renting a space above the Brookie drugstore. And he was actually a friend of Lincoln's. He studied for a while in um, the Lincoln Herndon Law Office. And um, and he invited Lincoln to come to have a, pic have a photograph taken. And um, this is actually from 1843. Um, and, and this photograph was taken just before Lincoln went uh, to um, Washington, D.C., because Lincoln served one term as a U.S. representative in Washington, um, and and they needed a photograph. So, um, but also taken that day was a photograph of Mary. So, kind of a companion um, photograph, and I show you that. Uh, the the Mary said Mary Todd Lincoln, who I will call Mary Lincoln from now on. Um, and that's another talk. <laughs> Mary said of these photos, they were very precious to me, taken when we were young and so desperately in love. Um, Lincoln, one of the next photographs taken of Lincoln was um, this one taken by, uh, you gotta love this name, Johann Carl Friedrich Polycarpus von Schneidau. Is that not the best name ever? Um, <laughs> uh, it was taken in October of 1854 in Chicago. Um, and Lincoln's had a friend, a German friend, whose name was George Schneider, not to be con confused with Mr. Schneider, who owned the Illinois Staatszeitung, the state newspaper, a German language newspaper, um, which Lincoln if maybe you knew this or not, Lincoln owned part of a German uh, language newspaper for a while himself. Mr. Schneider commissioned this photograph. Lincoln is well-dressed. He has a velvet collar. He's got a fancy tie. His hair is very artfully combed. Um, and the thing about the German language newspapers where they were pretty anti-slavery. Another interesting um thing about this photograph, if you look very carefully at the printing on the newspaper, it says Chicago Tribune. It wasn't actually Chicago Tribune when the photograph was taken. It was Staatszeitung when the, when the photograph was taken. But um, in an in elaborate kind of early photoshopping, if you will, um, when they needed a photograph, a dignified photograph of Lincoln when he was running for president. They changed the title of the newspaper because they didn't want him to appear too pro-immigrant. Um, one of my favorite photographs of, of Lincoln is this, what, what's often called the tousled hair um, uh, photograph. And it, if you look very carefully at it, um, you can see the, the things that I think later you will find are the things that make Abraham Lincoln look quite old and gaunt in later years. He has such, a, such an angular face and a, actually a pretty big nose and heavy brow ridges. And um, I think those will 
as he ages and loses weight, um, becomes so prominent that it will, it will age him in some ways prematurely. Um, Lincoln had this photograph taken because he was a member of the Chicago Bar Association and they requested a photograph. So uh, he had Alexander Hessler take this picture. He said that to the request from the Bar Association, I don't know why they want such a homely face. Uh, the photographer, when he came, was appalled by the state of Lincoln's hair and um, made him smooth it. But Lincoln didn't like it and and puffed it back up um, with his fingers. He ran his fingers through um, like a comb. And to Mary, he wrote, this coarse, rough hair of mine was in a particularly bad tousle at the time, and the picture presented me in its, all its fright. And um, the thing that I find interesting about that is that uh, the, the tousled hair is kind of a romantic vision of, um, of a, a fellow who is active. Um, and I, I offer as proof this... Um, photograph of James Buchanan, whose hair is messed up, and it was immediately preceding um, a, a president, and before him, Millard Fillmore, whose hair is messed up. Now, maybe they just didn't know how to get ready for a photograph. That's possible, too. Um, uh, in 1857, Lincoln had his photograph taken in Danville. Now, this time, he seems to have used a comb. Um, his, his face is already getting more angular, by the way. Um, for a while, I thought this photograph was taken in 1853. Um, some people have said it was in, taken in 1859, but pretty much scholars now agree that it was in 1857. Lincoln had a lot of friends in Danville. Uh, he had a, and this portrait was made by a fellow named Eamon Jocelyn. Lincoln got two copies of the photograph and they gave one to his friend, Thomas Hilliard, who gave Lincoln a photograph of Hilliard himself. So they swapped photos. Um, Lincoln had a lot of friends in Danville, um, right down the road from us. Um, one of them was, whose name was Ward Hill Lehman and Ward Lehman was uh, it was often noted was better at drinking and swaggering and being boastful than being a lawyer, although he was a lawyer. And consequently, when Lincoln went to Washington, he hired Lehman to be his sort of bodyguard. Um, this was also taken in a room in a drugstore. Um, there's Ward Hill Lehman. Uh, he was almost as tall as Lincoln and um, and quite a bit more imposing. And you can see that he, that Lincoln was much, a much thinner man. Um, this photograph was taken in 1858 in Peoria by R.M. Cole. Lincoln liked this photograph so much, he had many prints made and he signed it for his admirers. He even sent one copy, he made many copies and he had sent one copy to his stepmother. Um, and later, this particular image was used on, on campaign ribbons. Um, Lincoln often signed photographic prints for, for, for visitors then as well. Um, the photographer recollected, I cannot see why all of you artists want a likeness. Um, and because as Lincoln said, he's the homeliest man in the state of Illinois. Now, I don't think he's, I mean, he's not a particularly attractive man. I think he, I think they were right, um, both Lincoln and photographers. Um, but, uh, but he had a very, um, I, again, I think it's the angularity of his face that makes him look older. Um, this is his uh, mother, his uh, stepmother, by the way. So the famous white duster. Um, we'll talk about this in a moment uh, regarding the photograph that was taken of Lincoln in Urbana. Um, but here he is wearing a white duster. Now a duster was worn over the clothes um, to keep your, your actual suit 
clean when riding on the road, which Lincoln had to do. He spent 22 weeks a year uh, traveling around the state of Illinois on a, on the circuit um, as a circuit lawyer. Uh, with other lawyers, they traveled from court to court to court because there wasn't enough business in the Eighth Judicial Circuit. Lincoln traveled. Um, he traveled from Springfield to multiple counties um, throughout the state, notably McLean around us, uh, McLean County and DeWitt County and Piatt County and Champaign County and Dan uh, Vermilion County where Danville is, and then doubled back and went through county south of there. So he wouldn't naturally have a duster. Um, he has this photograph is pot, quite possibly was taken in Beardstown just after the Urbana with portrait was taken. Although there's some there's some dispute about when the Urbana portrait was taken, um, and it is purportedly was purportedly made just after the famous Almanac case. If you if you remember Lincoln. Um, said that uh, he he defended um, a fellow who was accused of crime because he said it couldn't have been perpetrated on the night that the key witness said it was because there was a not there was a full moon that there wasn't a full moon that night and he pulled a farmer's almanac out to show that there wasn't um, the uh, another reason that the white duster is, is um, quite well known is that when Lincoln was called to Cincinnati for Cincinnati, this is this is sad. But he was he was called to Cincinnati to help out with a with a federal case, and he was treated very poorly by the the lawyers who were already on the case, including um, uh, uh, Edwin Stanton who said he would not associate with such a dimmed, um, and I'm making that nice, gawky, long-armed ape as that. Stanton was not through with the insults, though. He said he told his fellow lawyers that Lincoln was a long, lank creature from Illinois wearing a dirty linen duster for a coat, and the back of which had perspiration splotched on it with wide stains that resembled the map of a continent. But I think that this Beardstown portrait shows really quite a um, compassionate face, um, weather beaten for sure. Um, another reason that I think that Lincoln prematurely ages, but um, but certainly not uh, not it, it, one can't tell a book by its cover, right? So here's the Urbana portrait. The Urbana portrait was taken. Uh, we believe either in October of 1857 or May of 1858. And if it were taken in May of 1858, it would be just before the Beardstown portrait we just saw. Um, there are two accounts about the Urbana portrait. Um, one was later given, about 40 years later, given by Henry Clay Whitney, who wrote a book called Life on the Circuit with Lincoln. Um, and Henry Clay Whitney was given to exaggeration. So uh, we're not entirely sure that his, his date or his recollection are accurate, um, but he does give the same account that later Judge Joe, J.O. Cunningham, Joseph Oscar Cunningham would give. And Cunningham was a judge in uh, and, and then subsequently a lawyer in Urbana for all the rest of his life and was well known for, for his recollections of Lincoln in the area for certain, but he was also well known for a lot of the um, good deeds he did. Um, and you can actually see a small exhibit about him in the courthouse right at the moment. Um, 
and Judge Cunningham and his wife left their home so that the uh, to the Methodist Women's Organization so that um, Cunningham Children's Home could be started. Uh, so he was um, he he uh, he gave this account of the of the Urbana portrait. He said one morning I was in the gallery of Mr. Allshuler, Allshuler being the photographer. Uh, when Mr. Lincoln came into the room and he had said he had been informed that Allshuler wished him to sit for a picture. Allshuler said he had sent such a message to Mr. Lincoln, but he could not take the picture in that coat, referring to the linen duster we just saw, um, and asked if he had, didn't have a dark coat in which he could sit. Mr. Lincoln said he had not, that this was the only coat he had brought with him from home. Allshuler said he could wear his coat and gave it to Mr. Lincoln, who pulled off the duster and put on the artist's coat. Allshuler was a very short man with short arms, but with a body nearly as large as, Mr. as, uh, as the body of Mr. Lincoln. So that's really interesting, isn't it? I'll talk about that in a minute. The arms of the latter extended through the sleeves of the coat of Allshuler a quarter of a yard, making him quite ridiculous, at which he... Lincoln laughed immoderately and sat down for the picture to be taken with an effort at being sober enough for the occasion. The lips in the picture show this. Well, I'm not sure that Lincoln's smiling, but often people call this the Lincoln smiling portrait. Um, and you can see that someone picked up the uh, negative, the glass plate negative too soon and put a thumbprint in the bottom left corner. Um, which gives you a general idea of how large or small, really, this, this photograph is. Um, the Allshuler photograph um, well, what I was going to say about the, about the uh, uh, let me show you a picture of Allshuler himself. So, uh, maybe a foot shorter than Lincoln, but just as, as as broad across the chest, meaning Lincoln was extremely thin. Um, again, adding to um, his gaunt appearance and and re and aging quickly. Um, this is Samuel Allshuler. Samuel Allshuler was uh, became later quite a well known photographer. His uh, he is he was a, a German um, Jewish fellow, and he is well celebrated on the uh, American Jewish History um, website. Um, and I um, was have been fortunate enough to talk to his granddaughter, who said when she was a small child and lived in Florida, he, she was not allowed to um, speak about uh, Mr. Lincoln in a in show and tell. But now she is asked to give talks about her, her great grandfather, it's her great grandfather, um, all over the state of Florida. Um, just a couple more notes about the Urbana portrait. This fellow in the middle on the bottom is Henry Clay Whitney. You got to love those sideburns of his. And the top, top fellow on the top right is um, Judge Cunningham. Um, and then there's an imagination of what it was like to be in in um, in, in Allshuler's studio. Well, Allshuler really didn't have um, a studio per se. He probably rented a room, like uh, Shepard did in in um, Springfield. Um, and so this illustration, there are a series of illustrations like this one on the left. Um, it says S. Allshuler's gallery on a on a big sign outside the uh, outside the gallery, and um, it was done. These this series of of um, drawings was done in the eight, in the nineteen fifties and sixties by um, Lloyd Ostendorf, who also organized all of the photographs of Lincoln into a uh, into a book for the first time, and so. He's to be lauded for that, but this is probably not how it happened um, in terms of, um, uh, of the photography, uh, organization of the photography. 
Ah, oh, this um, Preston Butler. Preston Butler took this photograph in a couple months after the Urbana portrait, probably uh, in July of 1858. Uh, and it was the day after the speech, uh, or day after a speech in which he first stated that slavery must be placed on the course to ultimate extinction. He had spoken anti-slavery before this, but not in quite that um, um, distinctive terms. Um, the, I find this a very, very odd and unusual portrait. Um, his hair is well, well combed and seems like it was combed kind of with a, a bowl on his head, um, cut with a bowl on his head rather. Um, and um, he seems unusually thin. Um, and uh, I, I think it may be the photographic process that, that, that is not, his, his features are not as distinct as they normally are. But he looks rather mild-mannered and meek here. Supposedly, that image was used for um, this uh, campaign poster in which, um, although I don't see it, I think there are other other photographs. I think this is a composite, um, but in which they celebrate Lincoln's humble beginnings. You can see, hey, down on the bottom left, he's um, he's chopping wood and planting corn, and um, it's uh, this was published in. March of 1861, when they were trying to convince people that the president-elect was a upstanding fellow, you see president-elect Abraham Lincoln. Um, the thing that that we do find out from that Preston Butler portrait, though, is that Lincoln was giving speeches just before, during the debates, and and after he was basically following Douglas around the, the state or or uh, follow or he, sometimes he would precede Douglas in an appearance. There there were debates certainly, but there were but there were many other times when they were just um, campaigning on the same day or the next day. And this happened in Champaign and there's actually a um, a long text on the on the Champaign Lincoln sign, which is near the police station in Champaign, um, about that appearance. And and that the account that we have is by Judge Cunningham. Um, he says, at an early hour, people began to flock into town. At 10 o'clock, a procession led by an Urbana brass band, the German band, and the Danville band, and over 60 young ladies on horseback with their attendants. 32 of whom represented the States of the Union marched to the Doan House for the purpose of escort, escorting Mr. Lincoln to the fairgrounds. The Doan House, an inn which served as the Demet Depot building, this is me, <laughs> was uh, north of the Goose Pond Church on the east side of the railroad tax. The Chicago newspaper wrote about Lincoln's speech that day. The number present was nearly, if not quite as large as those in attendance at the Douglas demonstration of yesterday. The enthusiasm 10 times as great. So Lincoln made a better appearance than Douglas in Champaign in August of 1858. Um, that's th this portrait of Lincoln was taken in Macomb in August of 1858, and I think it is the best evidence of Lincoln's drooping eye. Um, I don't think there could be any uh, argument about that. Supposedly, Lincoln was kicked in the head by a horse when he was a child, and it may have caused his left eye to have some paralyzed skin, and I think that's really evident here. He was also known to have had double vision, pro probably also caused by the same uh, um, Issue by the same accident, and some people said he had a wandering eye. And I just recently read, and I thought this was fascinating, that one author has gone so far as to say that Lincoln um, had a traumatic brain injury from that accident, and that led him to be 
depressed later in life. Um, the, the, uh, I think we're beginning to see uh, evidence here that he is um, getting quite a bit older. Um, by this time, he's almost 50. Um, but I don't know, people don't look like this at almost 50 now. But, you know, there are a lot of other variables there, nutrition and so forth. Um, on the, About this portrait, Lincoln was just was asked if he wanted to have a mirror, and he said it wouldn't be of much use. Um, this photograph taken by William Judd Judkins Thompson in October of 1858 was just before uh, his last debate with, with Stephen Douglas. Um, this, remember that Lincoln and Douglas were, were vying for the senatorial seat in um, Illinois, um, and Douglas won. Um, Lincoln had, so this was taken in Monmouth, or uh, Quincy, okay. Uh, he had walked to, in the rain, to sight of the, of the place where he was going to speak. He was under a small shed when he spoke. He spoke for three hours. Uh, the photographer's nephew re remembered later, in later years, um, he said he remembers the uncanny carrying powers of Lincoln's high-pitched voice, the outstretching of his enormous right arm as his chief, chief jester, and the great, great hand waving for silence. So th I think that's really interesting because it kind of makes Lincoln come alive. Like, certainly he towered over most other people. But the fact that, of course, his limbs were also very long. So when he made a grand gesture with his arm, it was, it was very dramatic. And then when he put his big hands up to stop people from chattering um, or to make a point, that was also very dramatic as well. The, the photographer's nephew said it was the proudest moment of his young life because he was able to lead Lincoln from the platform to my uncle's shop and watch the taking of the picture. And another uh, photographer said that he never saw Lincoln have a more dignified face. He does look very dignified in that photo. All right. Um, this photograph was taken in October of 1859 by a photographer, Samuel Fassett. Um, and it is... So October 59 is about a year before he's elected to, um, to the presidency. And he's, um, it is, it does show him in a very uh, positive light. And he did obviously use a comb that day. Um, this was said to be Mary Lincoln's favorite photo. She said it was the best likeness I've ever seen of my husband. Sadly, Samuel Fassett also took the photograph of um, Lincoln's uh, casket being carried into the um, courthouse in Chicago um, after his death. And that's what's on the bottom right. Um, one of the most famous of Lincoln's beardless portraits, and we should make the point here that Lincoln's did not have a beard until after he was elected. Um, while he was president-elect, he grew the beard, and we'll see that in a moment. Um, but this is probably the most famous of his beardless um, portraits because he gave a speech at the Cooper Union, which was a, um, an area of study in, in New York City. And it's also one of the earliest photographs taken by Matthew Brady. Matthew Brady, of course, took hundreds and his studio took hundreds of pictures of um, during the Civil War. And uh, this one was taken on February 27th of 1860. He gave a very dramatic and very well-received uh, 
speech that day and the Eastern Republicans were very impressed by it. And he immediately uh, appeared on the cover of Harper's Weekly, which was an influential magazine at the time. Um, the photograph was turned into a, um, uh, an engraving in record time. And it was flipped, as you can see, because it's an engraving. Um, but uh, it probably was the thing that made him actually popular. Uh, just before the state Republican convention, um, Lincoln went to... Um, they were, they were, there was a fellow making ambrotypes at the convention and, and, and it was called the people's ambrotype gallery. And, um, the photographer Edward Barnwell said he was the biggest man in the gallery. <laughs> Lincoln was, um, I, he looks like Dracula in this photograph to me, editorial comment. Um, but it's interesting how his hair keeps changing, um, how his uh, how his his face becomes more gaunt, and we know over the course of the four years in the White House that Lincoln lost a lot of weight, and I think that that will add into, and we'll see that in a moment. Um, uh, at the Republican National Con Convention, um, a, an influential uh, New Yorker, I believe, um, New Jersey, sorry, politician from New Jersey, Marcus Ward, asked that there be a photograph taken of Lincoln just after he was um, nominated so that they would have a one that would make Easterners think he wasn't a rube. And so um, his, Lincoln is very dressed up in this photograph and, and very well kept, well kept, not... Uh, not one of those earlier, um, more humble photographs. Um, and then he goes back to Springfield and um, Hessler takes, Alexander Hessler takes his photograph in June of 1863 in Springfield. Um, and um, Lincoln really liked this photo, he said. The second one, he said, expresses me better than ever I, than any I have ever seen. If it pleases the people, then I am satisfied. Um, and and one of these, um, a, a copy, a very nice copy of one of these is hanging in the uh, Urbana Courthouse. Hessler is, uh, was quite a well-known photographer as well. Um. When once Lincoln was nominated, everybody wanted a photograph of him. So Henry Kirk Brown asked for uh, for um, a photograph be taken of him so that he could make a sculpture of him, and in fact ended up doing that. Um, so here's the here's the photograph that was taken, and <laughs> here's the sculpture that was made. But I think it's quite interesting and it seems quite possible that Laredo Taft also used this photograph to, um, to make the sculpture that is in Carl Park now. Um, it was, this photograph was found in the effects of the sculptor. It wasn't known before that in um, 1938. I think it was known before that. I, I, because I can't, it just it's too close to the the Taft sculpture. Um, the wrinkles of the of the vest, the way his hand is placed on the on the um, left arm, the way his feet are arranged, even the tilt of his head. Um, it's actually more like the Laredo Taft than it is like the 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 brown um, sculpture. A miniaturist, that is a fellow who made pictures that were really tiny um, so that people could carry them around, especially painters, uh, also asked for um, for Lincoln's uh, photograph. And 
uh, he commissioned several, several portraits, including these two, uh, to make the miniature. The, the photograph is in the bottom that he used is in the bottom uh, center, and the miniature that he made from it is in the top right, of course. And you can see, as always, <laughs> the painter improved the improved the, the uh, photograph. He said the painter actually said there are so many lines in the face that it becomes a mask. His true character shines out when in an animated conversation or in telling an amusement tale, amusing tale. He is said to be a homely man. I do not think so. So John Henry Brown didn't think he was was homely. Um, so Grace Bedell is a young girl who request who wrote a letter to Lincoln and said, let your whiskers grow. You would look a great deal better for your face is so thin. And so just after Lincoln was elected to the presidency in November of 1860, while he was in Chicago for three days, he allowed a photograph to be taken of him as he was beginning to grow out his beard. And the photograph was taken by none other than Samuel Allshuler, the same guy that took the Urbana portrait. By now, Allshuler had moved on. He probably was an itinerant photographer, had moved on to Chicago where he would take this first whiskers photograph of Lincoln. Um, and at this stage, it seems to soften his face, but I think later it seems to make him seem older. Um, and this is a picture of Grace Bedell. All right. Oop. Moving fast. <laughs> we are now at uh, the point at which Lincoln has a full beard. Well, it's not quite full yet, but this is what he looked like just before leaving uh, Springfield um, in 1861. Um, is he probably needs a haircut? His beard is not not quite trimmed. Um, he's looking quite a bit older. Uh, but and the beard does nothing to 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 help that gaunt face. Um, as soon as he arrives in Washington, February of 24th of 1861. He has his first official portrait taken. He's still president-elect because the um, inauguration was in March in those days. Um, but we've arranged him so that he's in a very dignified pose, sitting. Um, we, can, we can see his whole figure. Uh, you can really see how tall the man is here. Uh, he's he's three-quarter view. It's very classic. Um, and by May, he's shown in the same chair, Boop. um, <laughs> but now with his top hat again in, in this kind of, uh, not straight on view as many of the others have been. And here's very pensive, um, it, you can almost see the weight of the presidency is at least being trying to be con conveyed here by the photographer who is Matthew Brady. Um, this photograph was actually originally a stereograph meant to be shown in three dimensions with one of those stereograph um, machines, um, kind of the precursor to the view master. Um, Lincoln did have some photographs taken out in the world. Um, uh, he was, he went during the civil war, he went to visit the troops a few times. And um, of course there's a famous spurious quote, although Lincoln had not, did not have a very much um, good to say about, uh, about general McClellan. Um, there's a spurious quote that when that Lincoln said, when you're done with my troops, can I use them? Because he did not appreciate the slow pace at which McClellan moved. Um, I like this photograph so much because it shows, it just shows how Lincoln towered over almost everyone else. 
Um, he's at, he's actually visiting Antietam at this point in 1862. Um, and you can see uh, what a um, striking profile he has. Um, and I think, again, it's because of the angularity of his face. Um, in 1863, Lewis Emery Walker took this photograph. Very unusual for the presidency. It's very casual. His coat's unbuttoned. His hair is droopy and kind of uh, not, not, not romantically unkempt, nor um, nor tidy, which is, seem to be the the two versions that we normally see. Um, he has he, the, he has a a kind of a rugged look here, but you can also see that that uh, damaged eye in this photograph. Uh, next, okay. Um, one photographer has said of this, uh, uh, t t said of when taking Lincoln's photograph, his large bony face when in repose when was unspeakably sad and as unreadable as that of a sphinx. His eyes were as expressionless as a dead fish but when he smiled or laughed at one of his own stories or that of another, then everything about him changed. His figure became alert. A lightning charge came over his countenance. His eyes scintillated, and I thought he had the most expressive features I have ever seen in a man. So here, I think that is well shown in this. And um, somebody pressed his long coat for this photograph. And, and I think this photograph shows the absolutely gigantically long legs that Lincoln had. And, um, but what a, what a noble and dignified face in this photograph. Uh, Gardner did an excellent job at, at showing um, Lincoln could look uh, sophisticated and, and thoughtful. Uh, November of 1863, this is the closest in time to the Gettysburg Address and is often called the Gettysburg Address uh, photo, although it happened a couple of weeks before that, um, uh, partly because of the quality of the photo, but also partly I think here we start to see that Lincoln's really gained a lot of age in his face, a lot of wrinkles. Um, the presidency has definitely taken its toll on him. Um, in February of 1864, Anthony Berger um, took, took several photographs of Lincoln, but one of them was um, the one that ended up being the one chosen for the Lincoln Penny. Um, it, the Lincoln Penny was created in 1909 in celebration of the uh, centennial of Lincoln's birth and was designed by an artist named Victor Brenner. But Berger was the manager of the Brady, of the Matthew Brady studios. And so he was the one who, um, when Brady couldn't take a picture of Lincoln, was sent out to take a picture of Lincoln. Um, the profile, again, very, very striking. Um, Berger was also the one who took the photograph that ended up being on the $5 bill. Um, and interesting thing about Berger was he was a kind of very similar to Lincoln in, in broad strokes. He was a, a German immigrant. He had, he had become a locksmith first and then worked his way up through, uh, Brady's studios, became a photographer and then the manager of the, of the studios. Um, and then his two photographs become the ones that we all know Lincoln by, the, the, the penny and the um, $5 bill. The penny was made in 1909, but the $5 bill wasn't, wasn't created until 1914. Um, and and this, the face of the $5 bill was changed for the most recent $5 bill, where they made those crazy big faces and many colors. Um, but it's still based on this photograph. 
I don't know what was going on with Lincoln's hair this day. Um, <laughs> but now we're getting like to very close to Lincoln's death. Um, this was take this was taken in 1865, um, about about the same time as the second uh, life masks were made of Lincoln. There were two sets of life masks made. Um, and right about the same time as this was taken, that life mask was taken. Here, I'll show you the life mask. Um, and, and to me, from the life mask, you can see that the strain of the presidency was written on his face. His secretary, he had two secretaries, uh, John Hay and um, I'm trying to remember the other guys. The name, his last name was Nicolay. So Nicolay and Hay were 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 Lincoln's secretaries. Um, John Hay remarked on the difference between the two life masks. In 1860, Lincoln was a man of 51 and young for his years. It is a face full of life, of energy, of vivid aspiration. The other is so sad and peaceful in its infinite repose as a look of one on whom sorrow and care had done their worst without victory is on all features. Um, then uh, there's the, uh, Lincoln had several photographs taken with his kids. Um, this one was taken February 5th of 1865. Um, there was never actually a family grouping of the three. So Lincoln had four sons. One of them died before they went to Washington, DC. One of them died while Willie died while he was in, uh, in the white house. And the other two sons died after Lincoln's own death. Um, but there was never actually a family grouping photograph taken. Those were artfully put together by engravers later. We'll look at one in a second. Um, Lincoln was apparently very indulgent of his kids and let them run around the White House like crazy. And and also his law partner in Springfield said that they, you know, they spilled ink everywhere and, and distributed papers everywhere. He was a very indulgent parent. But here he is shown with Tad. Tad, who couldn't, uh, who most children couldn't, couldn't stand still for the portrait, is shown with a strut holding him up so that he would stand still long enough for the um, photograph. Lincoln was able to sit still, of course. Um, and I, you could really see his weight loss in Lincoln's weight loss in this photograph. Um, and, uh, and how how gaunt he is getting, and how old he is looking, as the as the uh, Hay said in the previous. Here's a here's a photographer or a uh, engraver's um, imaginative um, family grouping photograph with Robert standing in the background, Ted at Lincoln's side, and Willie sitting next to his mother. Um, Here's uh, the photograph taken in February of 1865 for a portrait artist, Matthew Wilson, um, by Alexander Gardner. Um, and here again, Lincoln's become a very old man in a very short amount of time. He's he's it's just before his um, 56th birthday. Here's the here's the the painting that was made as a result of this photograph. Sort of a cheerful, happy old man, <laughs> as opposed to a, a wizened old fellow. Uh, this is supposedly the last portrait of Lincoln, um, and uh, it's. There are a couple of others that are that actually happen later. Um, it's the only print because it, uh, the plate was broken almost immediately, and just like that last one, I think Lincoln looks really quite quite a bit older than he did even a year earlier. 
Um, this is a famous photograph taken in uh, March of 1865 during the inaugural. And that one big tall fellow in the middle with paper is Lincoln delivering that famous second inaugural address. Uh, as, the, as the Civil War was winding down and looked like it was about to end and Union victory was near, he gave that famous speech. Uh, in which he asks for the nation's wounds to be healed. He says, with malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we were in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for the widow and the orphan and, and so forth. Um, again, we can really see how Lincoln towers over his fellow people. Uh there's the Capitol building as it remained unfinished. And this is, this is truly thought to be the last photo of Lincoln to be taken while he was alive. It was taken on the porch of the White House. It was it's sometimes called a paparazzi photo because he wasn't really prepared. And this photographer kind of caught him walking out of or either standing outside the White House on the porch or leaving and said, can I take your photograph? And Lincoln, of course, agreed, but he wasn't very happy. So this is a grumpy Lincoln. Um, mm. <laughs> um, uh, again, you can see how how um, he looks so much older. And then this is the last uh, photograph that we know of of Lincoln. Um, this is very interesting. This is Lincoln in his coffin lying in state in Washington, D.C., or, yeah. Um, so sec the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. Edwin Stanton is the guy that called him an ape when he was in Cincinnati, okay? Edwin Stanton ordered that no photographs be taken of Lincoln's body. Uh, thinking that was missing an opportunity, General Townsend, the general in charge of the funeral train, allowed one photograph to be taken, and that's this photograph. Stanton was really mad about that, and he ordered all of the plates to be destroyed. Fast forward nearly 100 years. In the 1950s, a, a man named Ron, a young man, a kid named Ronald Rietveld, was a history buff in Des Moines, Iowa, and he wrote to the state historian Harry Pratt, the state historian of Illinois, and told him of his interest in Lincoln, and Pratt invited him to come look at the papers of Nicolay and Hay, Lincoln's um, private secretaries. Rietfeld, the 14-year-old kid, found a photograph in a folder and ran down the hall to show Mr. Pratt. Apparently, Stan Edwin Stanton, the guy who called him an ape, the guy who ordered that all the photographs be destroyed because he thought it was uh, undignified to keep it, such a photograph, Edwin Stanton had kept one photo for himself. And his son gave it to one of the secretaries, Mr. Nicolay, when his father died. So the man who had so much contempt for Lincoln in Cincinnati protected his re reputation in death and couldn't bring himself to get rid of the last photograph of Lincoln. And that's what I have to say. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks for that, Barb. Um, uh, as Barb mentioned, if you have any questions, feel free to jot those in the comment section. Um, always appreciate, you know, hearing, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with the stories of, uh, you know, the all Shuler portrait there in Urbana, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 Grace Bedell story with the whiskers photo, but I've never seen some of those photos. Like, I don't think I've, I'm, I'm too familiar with the, uh, life mask photo where Lincoln's got the crazy hair and, and, and all of that. I haven't seen that so much, I guess, but, uh, um, uh, always appreciate those stories. And I, I had a question, Barb, you know, sure. I, um, 
you know, we have we have the uh, Lincoln exhibit at the Museum of the Grand Prairie, Champaign County's Lincoln, that you curated um, a few years back. Um, but, uh, you know, for those folks who are local, who want to learn more, I mean, you you told some excellent stories associated with these photographs. What would you recommend for folks, you know, whether they're local or other resources out there, if they want to learn more about some of these 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 stories of Abe Lincoln? You know, you mentioned the uh, courthouse exhibit. Um, we saw a few Lincoln Wayside signs. Anything else you uh, wanted to mention to folks if they wanted to learn more about 16th president? Well, there are. Um, so if we're going to talk strictly about local history, then I would. Um, I would, of course, visit the Museum of the Grand Prairies exhibit. There is an exhibit in the courthouse, which is open every day. The courthouse is open. Remember not to take your cell phones, <laughs> which tells a little bit more about Lincoln and his legal career in, in Champaign County. There are seven or eight. Um, I'm just trying to remember off the top of my head. Um, wayside signs that were made by the Looking for Lincoln um, group. Uh, the Abraham, Link. there's a national heritage area all across the center of the state of Illinois um, that's uh, dedicated to all the counties that Lincoln either gave a speech in in his, in his Douglas, Lincoln, the Lincoln's Douglas debates, or more appropriately in the part of the H judicial circuit. Um, and all of those counties have wayside signs um, that tell about what Lincoln did there. Now, they don't say Lincoln slept here, but um, for example, the I showed the champagne sign um, and that talks not only about Lincoln's appearance when he spoke, um, but also the Goose Pond Church, which was right there. The fact that right across the street is probably the only building in Champaign County that Lincoln ever saw, which is now the house of the, the it's the, was once the, um, Cattle Bank and is now the Champaign History Museum. Shout out to our, our sister institution. Um, there's a sign, there are two signs that are banned and one by the courthouse talking about fun things he did at the courthouse um, and one just down the street where we think the location of all Schuler's um, photo photography temporary studio, if, for want of a better word was um, there are two at the museum, two wayside signs at the museum talking in general about Lincoln. And um, there's one out by Homer Lake. There's one close to St. Joe. There's one in Tolono. Of course, Tolono is where Lincoln um, last uh, saw anybody in Champaign County and some debate, but as possible as the last time that train stopped in Illinois. The people in Danville, thank you, stopped in Danville. Uh, <laughs> there are just oodles and oodles and oodles of biographies of Lincoln. I would recommend one uh, ones by um, Michael Burlingame, really good, good author. Um, my favorite is not one that's loved by historians. <laughs> There's a trio of books. One's called The Prairie Years and two are called The Civil War Years. And they're by Carl Sandburg, the poet. They're not terrifically historically accurate. They're not, uh, in, they're not terribly inaccurate. But I think you get a better sense of who Lincoln was. And um, they're great read. So that would be what I would read. <laughs> um, and then if you want really close, like a book, uh, I would go looking at J.O. Cunningham's History of Champaign County. That, cool. that could go on and on. Yeah. That, <laughs> Henry Clay Whitney wrote, you know, Life on the Circuit with Lincoln. And that's, uh, that. there's some probably spurious information in that because it was 40 years later that he was remembering all this stuff. Um, there is a really good book, though, that's con fairly contemporary, it was just written a few years ago by Guy Fraker. Um, and it's uh, it's part of a series by the Abraham Lincoln National Heritage Area. Um, uh, you know what? I'm gonna make a list of this and I'll 
I'll make sure that it's posted on our Facebook page of the biography, uh, bibliography, because cool. I should have done that. Sorry, but Guy Fraker's book, go go look for it. We have it in the store on the museum shop, I think. So we do, and it's really? it's actually goes through all of the counties of the circuit. Cool. So tons of resources out there for. Yeah, well, <laughs> nobody ever gets tired of writing about Abe. I'm yeah. afraid. <laughs> One of the more uh, studied figures throughout he's history. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to drop those in the comments section. Got a few comments, a few, a uh, little bit of praise coming in here. Um, Nancy says, "Love the historical talks you do, watching from Champagne." Thank you for tuning in, Nancy. We appreciate doing these programs. You know, these these virtual programs to reach out to you all. Uh, uh, Karen also says thank you. Um, and, uh, Doug, uh, fascinating history. I had no idea there were so many photos of Lincoln and the stories behind them. Thank you for the excellent presentation. And there, you know, each, as, as we know, you know, here in the museum world and, uh, you know, these photos are artifacts, each, each artifact has a story and maybe more than one story, you know, that are often associated with them. So I always enjoy learning the stories and I always learn something new each time, you know, with, uh, with these programs. So I really appreciate it, Barb. Yeah, um, I, I I forgot to mention that if you go to the Library of Congress uh, website, you will get lost and never come out. <laughs> so that's loc.gov, libraryofcongress.gov, right? And I pretty much pretty sure every portrait ever of Lincoln is on that on that website, and. Um, there's also usually a little bit of commentary about the photograph. So if you want to look for one of those again, um, you will probably find it there. Cool. Great resource, Library of Congress. Like oh you my said. gosh. And you know what? It belongs to us, guys. It belongs to us. Right. It doesn't belong to anybody else. The Library of Congress belongs to the people. Might, <laughs> might as well use it, you know, That's if it's right. available to all of us. So. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, uh, that seems to be it, Barb, uh, as okay. far as comments or questions coming in. Uh, appreciate you again for giving the presentation. If you have any other further questions or comments, uh, if you're watching this uh, recording at a later time, feel free to drop those in there. We'll keep an eye on those as well. But uh, again, thanks to Barb. Thanks to you all for tuning in. And as I did at the very beginning of the program, I mentioned that uh, we'd love for you to take just about five-ish minutes or so. Let us know what you thought about today's program. If you have any suggestions for future programs, feel free to let us know in this survey that I just dropped into the comment section again. Well, everybody, uh, take care. Stay safe. If you're local in central Illinois here, uh, here in Champaign, southwest Champaign, where I am, got a little bit of snow. Make sure uh, we stay safe, stay warm out there. And um, until next time, thank you all so much. Thank you. Enjoy your Sunday. Super Bowl. <laughs>